Good morning. What a bright sunny day. Temperatures are rising. Spring is upon us, right? Beautiful day. We welcome, of course, somebody I just learned who was baptized in this church. Emily is at the organ seat today. Oh, there's an announcement in the bulletin and also why more wasn't made of uh, the departure of Gary. But uh, we want to keep him in our thoughts and prayers too. But we welcome Emily back to the place where a lot of this began. Shall we be joined together on a responsive call to worship, please? Our help is in the name of the Lord. We are sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah. We are born of the Spirit, born from above. God loved the world in the gift of Jesus Christ. To you, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I am a phrase this morning is selection number 419. Guide me, O thou great, Je o thou great Jehovah. Number 419, please. Because none of us is the person we would like to be, nor that we ought to be. Therefore, as individuals and as a congregation, let us join together responsibly in our call to, in our prayer of confession. There are times when we are unsure of the voices we hear, and we ignore them. In so doing, we sometimes ignore the voice of God. There are times when we readily want to hear the call of those with whom we agree, and we assume that God would only confirm to us what we already think. In those times, we also ignore God. We offer to God all those times, and we pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit in discerning where to go and which way to turn. 
Let us look not merely at the world around us, but dare to lift our hearts as high and wide as we can. And in so doing, may we know the vast and forgiving love of God. Amen. Our lives are in God's hands. We can only glimpse the mystery of the source of love, who can give life to the dead and cause into existence the things that do not exist. Yet as we look up and trust, there comes to us an abiding assurance that we are not alone. Receive with humility and joy the rebirth God offers this day and for all eternity. Believe these words, this good news. Go forth to serve our Lord in peace. Indeed, that we might serve him as he desires. God gave us two rules by which we should live our lives when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This, he said, is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. In these two rules are summarized all the law and the prophets. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning is taken from the book of Genesis, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 12. Hear these words. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Here ends our first lesson.
I know you're listening when a Presbyterian congregation starts to clap. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, choir. The New Testament lesson is taken from the Gospel of John, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 3. Hear these words. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, and he said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever might believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save the world through him. Here ends the readings. May God open our hearts and minds to the message. Do I have any young Christians this morning? Okay, we'll avoid that then. Um, the hymn of preparation then is number 416. If you will only let God guide you, number 416, please.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the thoughts, the meditations, and the reflections of this your congregation find acceptance and pleasure in your sight, Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Writing some years ago in the Christian Century magazine, Pastor Richard Lisher shared an experience in which one of the pillars of his congregation had stopped by his office before services to announce that he had been born again. You've been what? Lisher asked. Yes, he said. Last week I visited my brother-in-law's church, the Running River of Life Tabernacle, and I don't know what it was, but something happened, and I'm born again. You can't be born again, Lisher said. You're a Lutheran. You're the chairman of the board of trustees. The man was brimming with joy, but Lisher was sulking. Why, you might wonder. Isn't that what ministers are supposed to want for their congregants? The reason Pastor Lisher was sulking is because spiritual renewal is wonderful as long as it occurs within acceptable channels which are generally mainline, and the renewal does not threaten one's understanding of God. Indeed, it is interesting to note how often our New Testament lesson this morning from John 3 has been used as a proof text by various groups in order to support their need for security. How often has that slogan been huckstered on street corners by men and women ready to tell you precisely how that is supposed to happen? And unless it happens in the manner they prescribe, then you are lost forever, doomed to a life heading straight to hell. Ministers can also get targeted in this fashion. Tom Rother shares this one. Let me ask you something, the caller said, without even identifying herself. Are you a born-again Christian? Rother thought so and so. Here we go again. Some self-appointed spiritual vigilante has taken it upon herself to check out my credentials. Resisting the temptation to say some of the decidedly non-pastoral things which flitted through his mind, he simply replied, yes, I am. What about you? Well, the woman was obviously not calling to discuss her spiritual life, so she answered that question with more of her own. Do you believe in the virgin birth, she asked. Do you believe in the inerrancy of the Bible? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Do you pray and prophesy in tongues? Tom replied, Yes, I do believe in the virgin birth. No, I probably don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture according to your definition. Yes, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And no, I don't prophesy in tongues, although occasionally my congregation may think I'm speaking in a foreign language. The woman was not amused. The conversation ended with her telling Tom that he had no business pastor or congregation if he was not a born-again Christian. And that as far as she could tell from what he had said, his status was, at best, questionable. Tom might have thanked the woman for her concern, but she hung up without giving a chance to say anything more whatsoever. And without ever saying who she was. It's hard to dialogue with someone who wants only a monologue. To be sure, our New Testament lesson this morning is one of the most familiar passages of the Bible, especially since it is where you find that phrase about being born again. And it includes John 3.16, of course, which you will see referenced in all sorts of places, including the stands of professional football games. That verse reads, of course, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever might believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is also a section of scripture which many find upsetting and disturbing. 
People do not like being told that they don't have it right, that they're confused, or worse yet, they're simply wrong. When you've lived your entire life with a certain understanding and someone comes along who tries to tell you you've had it wrong, perhaps from the very beginning, you're not likely to get a positive response. Nicodemus was, if not the first, certainly one of the first to exemplify that phenomenon. Nicodemus was a spiritual leader of the Jews, a Pharisee who served on the ruling Sanhedrin council. That council was composed of 72 leading men of Jerusalem. They regulated Jewish life and culture. Nicodemus was privileged to serve on the Sanhedrin Council, which held legislative, executive, and judicial powers within its purview. As such, Nicodemus was in the know. He knew what was happening in and about Jerusalem, and he gained considerable knowledge over the years about Jewish life and culture. When he became aware that there was a new rabbi or teacher making an impact upon Jewish life, it was natural that he would check out this new guy. You may recall the milkman, Tevye, in the musical Fiddler on a Roof, who had been taught to revere tradition, and as such, he stood on a long line of those who likewise sought to maintain the teachings and ways of Jewish tradition. Nicodemus did not categorically dismiss Jesus, as no doubt other cohorts of his were doing. Still, he felt in the dark about this man, Jesus, and he was suspicious of him. So he sought Jesus out at night, while it was dark, to gain some clarity and illumination. Unfortunately, Jesus did not provide Nicodemus with the sort of clarity he was seeking. Jesus told this highly respected and revered gentleman that he must be born anathem, the Greek word, a word which is translated as again or from above. Now it's clear from the ensuing dialogue that Nicodemus understood Jesus to be saying again rather than from above. How can someone be born when they are old, he asks incredulously. How can an old man enter his mother's womb to be born? And truth be told, Nicodemus had a point. This does sound strange, even weird. No one can start his or her life over again. Certainly no one can enter his mother's womb after he or she has been born. It is a paradox. And it is a paradox deriving straight from the mouth of Jesus. Our Methodist brothers and sisters are in the line of John Wesley, who was already 35 when he brought himself into contact with some Moravian missionaries in London. He had finished his studies years before and been ordained a priest. But now, at age 35, he first discovered his spirit being strangely warmed, as he expresses it. Wesley was changed for the better right then and there, in his Aldersgate experiences, as has been called. Those of us who have gathered here this morning have made our public confession of faith, and we've heard these words of Jesus throughout our faith life. As a result, we may have quite a different reaction to these words, and a reaction which is little different from Pastor Lisher, whose board president had been born again, despite being a confessed Lutheran. We've, consist, we've conditioned ourselves to believe that these words don't really apply to us since we've been confirmed. We've made our public confession of faith. God loves us just the way we are, as faithful and loyal Presbyterians within the Reformed tradition. And consequently, there's no good reason for us to change, despite our song of the morning. I'm reminded of an old Wheaties breakfast cereal advertisement which highlighted 1952 and 56 Olympic pole vault champion Bob Richards. After showing Richards clearing the bar in perfect form, the advertisement asks, how do you improve upon perfection? 
do you think you're perfect just the way you are? On this second Sunday of Lent, I believe God may be asking each one of us to ask ourselves how we might improve. What could we do to change for the better? It may be hard and humbling for us to admit, but none of us is as good as we could be or as we should be. Nicodemus was awfully good by the standards of his day, and those standards would no doubt make him an outstanding man in our day and age as well. Jesus had the audacity to ask Nicodemus to change for the better, to continue to grow and develop into all that God intended him to be. Now, long before the time of Jesus, there was a man who packed his belongings along with his wife and set out for a land which he felt the Lord was promising to him. When Abraham packed his belongings and set out for the promised land, he had no assurance that he would ever again see any of his relatives or friends whom he was leaving behind. And to the best of our knowledge, he didn't. Abram set out, not knowing where he would end up. Now, it's not hard to imagine that Abram or his wife Sarah could have pined for persons in their past. Still, neither Abraham nor Sarah reverted or turned back. They kept going ahead pressing onward, following the dream and the call which they believed Abram had received from God. What Abram did is tough, and no one should ever suggest it is easy. It's difficult. It's trying, in part because of what could be termed the law of inertia. Isaac Newton, of course, was the one who gave us the laws of inertia. His first law states that an object either remains at rest or moves at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an external force. There are a lot of forces which induce us to remain where we are and are to continue along the path on which we're already engaged. It takes a lot to get us moving and something more to get us to change our course. But that's what Abram did. And it's why he's respected and revered by so many today. In fact, Abram remains the father of the three great monotheistic traditions. There is something like three billion persons on the face of this earth today who identify Abraham as their spiritual father. Judaism and Islam both revere Abraham as a figure who got things rolling. And in our Christian tradition, the Apostle Paul encourages us in Galatians 3 and Romans 4, 3, and 9 to view ourselves as children of Abraham by faith. Abraham is the pivotal figure in introducing right belief to humanity according to each of these faith traditions. As far as we know, Abraham had been a leading, good, and faithful man in his culture of the day. Though it was obscure, he was living in Mesopotamia when he felt call of God to venture forth to the land of Canaan, the so-called promised land. Inertia would have impelled Abraham to keep living where he was. Though we might be inclined to think that he didn't have it that good, still by standards of his day, Abraham did have it pretty good. He was successful. He enjoyed respect. Certainly, he was neither desperate nor destitute. There was nothing threatening him which impelled or compelled Abram to think that he should leave the region in which he had dwelt for years. There was no reason to leave his homeland and venture onto some new realm while leaving the remainder of his friends and family behind, never to be heard from or seen again. When Abram ventured forth from the promised land, it represented no small challenge. We know that his wife, Sarah, heard that she was going to have a son at one point. And what was her response? She laughed. Hence, when the son was born, he was named Isaac, which translates as laughter. When she learned that God had spoken to Abraham and directed him to leave his homeland for a new world, a promised land, Sarah must have wondered about her husband's mental state. 
They were safe and secure where they were. Why would they venture forth to some new land? Everything within her likely was telling Sarah that this was not a good idea. And yet it was that she believed, along with her husband Abraham, that it was God who was calling them to do this, to undertake this venture. So together with their belongings, Sarah and their nephew Lot set off for the promised land. Abraham overcame the law of inertia by faith. And because of his faith, we today are blessed. Blessed beyond anything which Father Abraham might ever have imagined. Nicodemus, too, was blessed as a child of Abraham. If anyone had it good, it would have had to have been Nicodemus. He was revered in his community, highly honored, deeply respected, and esteemed. Now, as a religious leader of the Jews, it would have been natural for Nicodemus to check out and become better acquainted with this up-and-coming rabbi from up north in Galilee. Was Jesus being true to the ways and teachings of the Jewish fathers? Nicodemus wanted to ascertain whether this Jesus was kosher, so to speak. That was part of his role as a Pharisee. Indeed, the word Pharisee may derive from a word for fence or hedge, since the Pharisees as a group tried to fence off from the Jews unhealthy and unwholesome influences. It was natural then that Nicodemus would seek out Jesus. Yet something more may be entailed too. Nicodemus, like others, sensed that Jesus was different. Something special, someone special. Perhaps even that promised Messiah of the Jews. Jesus did not have many friends amongst the rulers of the Jews, and that included the religious rulers. So when Nicodemus wanted to engage Jesus in conversation, he did so by night, in secret, under cover of darkness. Could Jesus possibly be this promised Messiah? Nicodemus had not a little to wonder about Jesus. He wanted to know, to be certain about him. And his quest to learn the truth about Jesus meant that he would risk his reputation in standing with and among his professional colleagues by engaging Jesus in conversation, dialogue, even debate. Nicodemus risked a great deal by visiting, just visiting Jesus. Yet he felt impelled to get to know this Jesus better. Was Jesus to be dismissed as a charlatan and a fraud? A misguided fake, perhaps, or as many of his colleagues had come to believe, just somebody that you're better off without? Or could it be that this Jesus was the promised Messiah? How could Nicodemus be certain of his answer to that question if he didn't risk getting personally acquainted with Jesus? And the word is, risk. Alex Haley, the acclaimed author of Roots, the book which traces his ancestry back to Africa, has observed, and I quote, too often we are taught how not to take risks. When we are children in school, we are told to respect our heroes. What we are not told is that these leaders were in fact rule breakers. They were risk takers in the best sense of the word. They dared to be different, unquote. All of those men, and it was only men, unfortunately, who signed our Declaration of Independence were risk, risking their necks, and they knew it. Of the 204 founding fathers of this nation, that is the men who signed the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and or the Constitution, nearly 20% of them were Presbyterians, including several pastors. It is within the Presbyterian tradition to take some risks, and we regularly celebrate those risk takers. Perhaps a question for us this morning is how much risk we are willing to take in our day. And if we're unwilling to take on any significant risk, then perhaps we can expect to be a lackluster and even a dying church. 
Oh, to be sure, we may have some modest successes. But God doesn't want modest when illustrious is attainable and within our reach. Robert Schuller was, of course, the founding pastor of the Crystal Cathedral in California and its Hour of Power television broadcast. He was certainly not averse to taking risks. And while he was at the helm, that congregation risked a great deal. And more often than you hear about, it failed. But through the results of those risks, they also accomplished a great deal for Christ. Indeed, Schuler regularly promoted possibilities. He was constantly encouraging persons to dream what might be possible. Possibility thinking, he called it. And despite misgivings by a lot of economists and accountants, that congregation regularly accomplished the dreams they felt inspired to realize under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Schuler regularly contended that God does not want you to fail. And in that, Schuler is indeed correct. God doesn't want any of us to fail either, any more than earthly parents wish for any of their children to fail. So when you work with God, when you open yourself up to the possibilities that God Almighty is placing before you and in front of you, then you can and you should expect good things to happen. More often than not, you will not be disappointed. Remember, God doesn't want you to fail. And our God will help you to prevail. On this Sunday, when we will be ordaining and or installing elders and deacons, it's well for those taking up these offices to be moved to dream dreams and to think about the possibilities for this Beverly Presbyterian Church. But change isn't easy. For those who walk with the Lord regularly find themselves being moved, changing themselves, their surroundings. And it's not always popular. Success was guaranteed neither to Abraham in the Old Testament nor to Nicodemus in the New. It took years before Abraham's faith was rewarded. He did see the promised land, resided in it for some time. He also held in his own arms a son, his own son by his wife, Sarah, who was well beyond the years of childbirth. Success was not guaranteed to Abraham, but he believed nevertheless. And God blessed him and worked with him. We're not certain what Nicodemus believed when he left Jesus that night. He had certainly been challenged to reformulate and rethink his views, in particular his views about God. Nicodemus apparently wrestled at length with Jesus and what he had to say. Eventually, it seems he came to have considerable sympathy for Jesus, his message and indeed his cause and mission. Hence, when Jesus died upon the cross, Nicodemus was one of those who sought permission from Pilate to remove Jesus' body from the cross. And again, this is not something that would have been expected of a respected Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the very body which had condemned Jesus to death. It involved risk. Risk to his reputation, risk to his stature within the community. But it proved to be a risk rewarded. Again, all of us tend to be averse to risk, myself included. We prefer to play it safe, not take chances. And inertia plays a big role in that. But faith challenges us to grow to dream, to develop, to mature. And that invariably requires change. During this season of Lent, it would be well for all of us to resist our personal inertia and instead risk to improve ourselves, to make ourselves something better. Indeed, the best that God desires us to be. Some practices maybe need to be abandoned. 
in order to accomplish that. But just as likely, some practices may need to be implemented to accomplish that. May God grace us one and all as we seek not to fail, but to see the will and the vision of God prevail. Let us pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we have heard words like this before. And yet, perhaps like John Wesley, advanced in his years as he was at the time, could be strangely warmed. And so can we be strangely warmed when we are born again, changed, born from above renewed, strengthened, invigorated. May that indeed be words used to describe us as individuals and for this church, this beloved Beverly Presbyterian Church of God. For we dare to ask it in the name of Jesus, your love and change aged incarnate, our Savior and Lord. Amen. invite you at this time to rise and affirm with me our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Shall we stand, please? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm glad to see you all changed your clocks, followed directions well. Um, I'd like to welcome any visitors who are here and uh, remind you of the pew pads at the end of your pew, if you would sign those, please. Um, also, we have a few announcements. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to welcome Emily. Very nice to have you here. And I see your mother in the first pew there, and I assume it's your grandmother. Welcome. Um, our uh, uh, Memorial Easter lilies will be uh, on sale now, and there should be an envelope in the pew. If you're interested in such, the instructions are in your bulletin. Um, we have a deacon's meeting today immediately following the service in the conference room. We have a session meeting tomorrow night at 7. And uh, also there's a reminder about the candle fundraiser. And you can see Dawn for that. Um, I believe that's that. Now, I hope I'm correct in announcing that we'll have our service next week and in the fellowship hall. We're finally having our ceiling repaired. And um, because of that, we will not be able to use the sanctuary next Sunday. So we will meet in fellowship hall. Um, hopefully it'll just be the one weekend, but we'll see how it goes. So um, we'll see you in fellowship hall next Sunday. Now, uh, the other thing is, does Gwen would like to um, say something. Is there anything else that anybody has to for announcements? No PNC meeting, no PNC meeting tonight. We have a youth group tonight. You and are having youth group? Okay. Okay. 
Okay. And um, if there are no other announcements, Gwen has something that she would like to say. <clears throat> yeah. Good morning. First of all, I know that uh, it was a shock to many people last week when they found that that was the last week that Gary was going to be with us as our regular organist. Let me assure you that it was not by anyone's design. Um, he did not want to leave. We didn't want to lose him. However, if you've read his letter, he goes into great detail. It's included in your bulletin. I hope you will read it because it explains a lot of things about his health and about the things that have been going on with him. Um, he told only one or two people and he wanted it to be completely confidential because he was afraid if there was anything extra said about it that it would upset him and it would cause him to have further uh, health problems. And so because of that, we said nothing. And I know that it's upsetting because we've known Gary for so long and you have the feeling this is a person we should honor, we should respect, we should do something for him. And we will at some point, I don't know exactly what. We don't want it to be anything that will cause him any kind of physical distress. And so we'll be careful about that. Um, it's, a, it's a complete burden to me <laughs> to lose him as a friend because he's been here with us for 25 years. And we've worked closely together many times. We've uh, communicated our own personal feelings about life and about things that were happening. And so to lose him to me is uh, something uh, that's hard to bear. But it will be fine, everything will come together. Uh, and I know that it's for his better um, physical condition that he should leave. A few years back, we tried to ease his burden some by splitting the job in two. If you remember, he was playing the piano for us for the choir, uh, practicing on Wednesday night, as well as doing his organ responsibilities. And so we divided that job up and gave the responsibility of the choir to someone else. And that did help some, and I think that he was grateful for that. But it has gotten to the point now where his health has deteriorated and the doctor has told him absolutely he must quit. And so we lose him with sadness, but um, that's, the, that's the way it happens to be. There is one other thing. You may have noticed if you were here last week that there were a lot of enclosures in our bulletin about the favorite hymns of the congregation because he had undertaken to uh, give a, a, we had a survey and he made a list of that our favorites, first, second, third, and so forth. And he had written up something for each one of those. And then on the Sunday that it was put in the bulletin, he played the particular pieces. Last week, there were many of them. And that's because he did not want to leave without finishing that responsibility. And so he contacted Sherry and made sure that they could be put in the bulletin. And then you weren't aware of it, but he played every one of those. And so all of our favorites were covered at some point between when we did the survey and when he left last week. Um, we will be doing something for him. I don't know what, but, uh, and I know in your heart that you're sad to see him leave too, but I just wanted you to understand the reason we didn't say anything was by his request. So that covers that, I think.
Will you join in the litany, which is printed in your bulletin, please? There are different gifts. Uh, we can do better than that, folks. <laughs> I know it's daylight savings time now, and you may be like me, an hour behind time, but we can do better than that. There are a variety of gifts. There are different ways of serving God. God works through people in many ways. Each one of us is given a gift by the Spirit. Together we are the body of Christ. Though we have different gifts, together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make his church useful in the world. And we call men and women to faith so that in the end, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as ministers of the word, ruling elders, or deacons. In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, remembering that our Lord Jesus Christ said, whoever among you wants to be great must become the servant of all. And if he wants to be first among you, he must be the slave of all. For just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give us life and to set others free. First, we need to ordain one of these people. So Kimberly, I'd ask you to come over to this bench, please. It's also a tradition that those who have been ordained as deacons in the past, if they've come to care, join with me for the laying on of hands. So I invite those who have been ordained as deacons in the past to come forward. Kimberly, receive authority to exercise the office of deacon to the glory of God and his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now to our class of 2023. God has called you by the voice of the church to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. You know who we are and what we believe, and you understand the work for which you have been chosen. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of the world and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Yes. Will you be instructed by the commissions of our church and led by them as you lead the people of God? Yes. Will you be a faithful deacon or ruling elder in obedience to Jesus Christ? under the authority of scripture and continually guided by our confessions? Do you endorse our church's government and will you honor its discipline? Will you be a friend among our comrades in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? 
Will you govern the way you live by following the Lord Jesus Christ, loving neighbors, and working for the reconciliation of the world? Amen. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in every age, you have chosen servants to speak your word and to lead your loyal people. We thank you for these servants whom you have called to serve you and your church. Give them special gifts to do their special work and fill them with your Holy Spirit so they may have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and be faithful disciples as long as they live. God, our Father, you have chosen them. Now strengthen them. Grant them wisdom. Grant them love to work for the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You are now deacons and elders within this Beverly Presbyterian Church. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him, in whose name we pray. Amen. You're welcome. Welcome to get you. Welcome, Charlie. Welcome. And you may be seated. to enable and empower the ministry of this church. This time our gifts, tithes, and offerings will be received.
Heavenly Father and gracious God, for all that with which you have blessed us, we give you thanks. And we return now a portion to you, asking that you will bless these, our gifts, our tithes and offerings, and use them to become instruments of ministry of your word and your will in this church, in this community, in your world. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray together. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, as the sun brightens the earth and continues to warm it as we head toward this wonderful season we call spring, we give you thanks for all the ways in which you have manifest and graced us with new life for children. For friends. For relatives. For your Holy Spirit gracing us and uplifting us. Encouraging us to get up and to get moving and to become the people you intend us to be. Continue to grace us with your Spirit, O oh God, and guide us. We pray for your grace upon all the peoples of the earth, oh God, but especially for those who are deeply concerned about a new virus threatening our very lives. Bless those who suffer from it, oh God, and bless those who minister to them as extensions of your hands and your fingers. We pray for those of our number, too, who are sick and ill, especially for Julia, for Joy, for Jane, and for a beloved soul and saint, Gary. Comfort them one and all, God. Uplift them and uphold them before your throne of grace, your mercy, and grant them health and your peace. We pray, too, for the mental health of young adults everywhere who are being challenged in so many different ways, ways in which many of us who are older could not have imagined in our youth. We pray you will be with them, granting them insight into what they should do, but moreover, courage to risk, perhaps even unpopularity, to do your will and to accomplish it. So continue the graces of God. Help us to be your people, a people in whom others see the love and life of Jesus incarnate anew. For we dare to pray to God in the name of your beloved Son, our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, who himself prayed and taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of the departure is number 386. Take my life and let it be number 386, please.
It's called, He Chose the Nails. Of course, it refers to Jesus taking the nails that would hold him to a cross so that our lives might be improved. These elders and deacons today probably don't have to look forward to being nailed to a cross. And hopefully the people of this church will not want to do that, but rather to work with them as fellow disciples, servants of the Lord, to accomplish God's will in this church, in this community, to take risk where it's necessary because God will challenge you to move or to get moving, to grow. So may the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.